Welcome to The Emergent Human, where we explore optimizing health, embodied spirituality, and post-conventional living. I'm Michael Osterlink, your host. Just a couple of short updates and news items. First of all, I want to thank my teacher, Amanda Jade Fiorini. She can be found at wildearthmedicine.com. I've been working with her this last year on changing, or I should say cultivating an eye thou relationship to the natural world, which is actually something I'll be talking today with today's guest. Just want to shout out to her because she's been really, really helpful in kind of expanding the way I think both about myself and the world in which we live in, both uh, having a positive benefit for me as an individual in that space, but also my work as a coach and teacher. Also want to congratulate uh, my friend and colleague, Dennis Stoika, for the release of his new book, The 1% Warrior, Top Seekers to Living 1% Better Every Day in Every Way. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Melissa Peterson, who invited me to speak at her longevity conference. I spoke about embodied cognition, multiple brains in the body, and mindsets, among many other topics. You can learn more and sign up for the free seminar at longevitysummit.com. All this information will be included in today's show notes. Today's show is brought to you by Costa Scafidi, an amazing body worker in the Northern Virginia area. He's my body worker. I see him for rolfing and other such things. Uh, he's integrated different somatic practices into his work, including rolfing. You can learn more about his work at cosperscafidi.com. Today's guest is a return guest. It's Ryan Fristinger. Uh, Ryan and I have been engaging in multiple conversations over the years. So unfortunately for you all, only one has been recorded. <laughs> Today's going to be number two. And this is as a result of a few different things. First of all, hello, Ryan. Good to see you. <laughs> I will have Ryan introduce himself for folks who did not get an opportunity to listen to his first interview that I did or did not hear him on Christopher Ryan's podcast or Rob Wolf's podcast or he did not attend the Paleo FX conference a few years back where Ryan also spoke as well. But this conversation that Ryan and I are going to have is, is around our relationship to the natural world in general, but also more specifically to the animal world and more even more specifically to domesticated animals. And this is generated from a few different things. Um, we have, my wife and I have uh, uh, rescued two dogs and for one of them dealing with a lot of health issues and which has required us to kind of to navigate between conventional veterinary care and what you might call holistic or alternative um, the language. We have to figure out the language for ourselves, but um, between those two different worlds, which is the same issues that I've dealt with in the human medical space as well. And my wife also volunteers at an animal shelter and she takes a lot of classes just to you know, learn because that's one of the things she's very interested in. And I always like listening to her studying things or watching her videos or engaging in conversations and it leads me to a lot of questions, some of which include the type of food we feed the animals, which also kind of reflects the type of food we feed ourselves. Also leads me to the type of habitats we have for the animals, which then questions also as a mirror, the habitats we have for them ourselves. And that both the way we treat ourselves, globally speaking, and we treat our animals domestically, globally speaking, you know, there's a mismatch between what they and we need to optimize our well-being and our health and, and the way we actually live and the way we treat them in many cases. And Ryan, you know, probably is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And uh, he's turned me on to a lot of thinking in this space. And I wanted to bring him on to kind of have this deep philosophical conversation with some actual practical outcomes for people listening and watching, like what they can do in terms of thinking differently, how they relate to the world around them, the natural world, as well as their, if they have animal pets. Um, so Ryan, before we kind of do a deep dive into all of that, if you want to mind just introducing yourself again, just briefly, that'd be great. So my name is Ryan Freisinger and most people know me as a genomics and functional medicine expert. Uh, my day-to-day -day life is mostly spent on all things genetics and developing what I call bioelectric therapies for the human body. Um, but the reason why today's conversation matters is originally my graduate work centered on the question of the animal, um, which belongs to an academic field in the literary uh, world called critical animal studies. And so when I did my master's degree, I wrote it on industrial animal slaughter and 
the ways that it mirrors uh, or mirrored at that time the war on terror and the language that was used to basically deconstruct animal bodies and and how we related to animals and how we used animals essentially as a way to define our own subjectivity and so from that I, I undertook PhD studies in comparative literature and my main theoretical field was something called posthumanism and the question of posthumanism that I was seeking was what identity formation do we as humans need to construct for ourselves to be able to live in a post ecological world that allows us to participate in the regeneration of the planet and to develop right relationships with all other beings and, and plants. And, and that question kind of dropped me into a lot of spaces that, definitely challenge that kind of day-to-day -day relationship that you have both with pets, but with, with all the other beings that often don't seem to be visible in the human landscape. Uh, in fact, some are not, some are just not there. And epistemologically, we don't have the ability to even apprehend uh, the fact that they're there. So today is a really personal uh, conversation. It's something I'm excited to get back to as a break from, you know, working on trying to get the human body functioning optimally. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this and seeing where to take us. Excellent. So, you know, per perhaps, you know, just a little bit more information, uh, how this even came up between you, you and I in terms of conversation. Uh, I mentioned uh, via text, you know, we were having a conversation that one of our dogs is dealing with certain ailments and you and you made some recommendations. I was like, wait, I know you're brilliant in, all these other areas, but how do you know this? And I just, I, then I just found out some of these study, you know, some of the other studies you've done. A um, couple things. So would you mind just talking about some of the studies you, you know, add more to some of the studies you've done, but also I think it's important to talk about your own, how you work with animals at your home. <laughs> like you, you're a savior of animals. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. So as someone who, probably is deeply on the autistic spectrum. Um, I would say that my closest relationships have always been with animals. So my caretaking of animals began when I was probably around three or four years old and it took the fashion of, I used to build houses for the squirrels and wildlife that lived around my house. And I used to do that at recess in school. Um, and so I had a, very deep relationship with a couple of different types of animals, uh, domestic squirrels, uh, Eastern gray squirrels, possums and armadillos. Um, and so from there I learned basically how to communicate without words with these particular animals and um, how to create a safe space so that they would come close enough to be able to learn something about them and to be able to hopefully be an ally. Um, and then from that, living with a mom who not only rescued every animal that we came across, but she also treated every animal as sacred. So she would, was also the person that would take animals that had been struck by cars off the road and, and you know, give them a dignified kind of life and remove their, their bodies from the roadway. So I was taught from a very early age that animals and myself were equal and that they deserve care and that, in fact, you know, their presence in our lives was something that, that was sacred. And so from all that, I moved into a person who has a long history of having rescue animals predominantly. And when I was in Los Angeles for about a decade, I rescued pit bulls through the Brittany Foundation that had been in fighting situations. I took care of a feral cat colony that had about 300 members. And then I also was an animal rights activist through my own research for animals and labs and things of that nature. And then currently I have nine cats and seven dogs that are all rescues. The dogs are all tiny chihuahua mixes. So they about together make up, you know, one full size dog. <laughs> and so seeing and dealing with the, with the animals on the rescue animals, I think the first, thing that I always tried to work on was reestablishing their ability to trust human beings and to be safe. And so I used to use a lot of Bach flower remedies um, to help the animals who had been abused or had been abandoned that, that suffer many of the same woundings that we do as people to try to at least begin the process of feeling safe in the environment, which tended to be at the root of a lot of the health problems. 
So with a lot of the domestic animals, you would see everything from food allergies to behavioral issues, et cetera, that were no different than ours. An owner abandoned them at a certain age, abuse. Uh, and then, you know, nutritious problems, of course, we'll get into that kind of problem, what we feed animals. But I worked a lot on that end. And then because of cost considerations, because to take care of animals, veterinary, you know, visits are quite expensive. So I began using homeopathy uh, regularly with animals um, years ago for simple things and run of the mill problems and then realized that it could work on more serious issues that didn't require kind of immediate surgery. So I've been using homeopathy with animals for probably 12 years and not just dogs and cats, birds, horses, um, other animals that are in the home and then occasionally with wildlife if, if it was possible. So homeopathy has been, and I studied under a guy named Will Falconer, who is a homeopathic DVM, who used to have a practice here in Austin, but now he's in India and, and does an online training where pet owners can actually learn to do homeopathy with their animals. And so, yeah, I've had this deep and long history with what I would call urban wildlife animals that come close to human settlements and then domestic animals of all types, rabbits, birds, cats, dogs, miniature horses, et cetera. Uh, you mentioned something I, which could be kind of the way into a, a, the deeper part of the conversation. Um, some of the traumas you help pets with or even wild animals are close to us um, distance-wise, using Bach remedies because they're dealing with emotional issues in terms of feeling safe, secure, and, and their ability to connect with you so, so then you can help them and treat them what is a completely different paradigm than oh uh, these are kind of robots not actually literally robots but there's no emotionality there's no cognition you know they do exactly what they've been programmed to do like a robot so there's an analogy there but obviously that's not true but that's a, that's a different paradigm can you talk a little bit about the paradigm which would acknowledge these beings with emotionality, with higher cognition capabilities, you know, with the ability to connect not just with their own species, but with us. And I've also seen one species connect with another species, not a human being, but another species yeah. in the world. No, I would say in general, all animals, and I would even extend this to the insect world because I've had a very deep relationship in the last couple of years with insects. It's very clear that every being on the planet has an emotional life. And the problem with acknowledging that is trying to overcome, overcome what we would call Cartesian logic, which is that, you know, we have rationality and other animals are basically automatons. And that's just not true. Um, one very important thing to know for dog owners that are out there is that most dogs have been neotenized, which means they're bred to remain infantile in their psychology huh. because otherwise they would not be hanging out in your house with you readily. So a lot of what we observe with animals is the work that we've done to modify their genetics and their behaviors over many, many years of cohabitation to make them more docile and reflective of our own needs from them. So that's one thing I like to say, but if you look at animals in general, I mean, the one paradigm that it attempts to acknowledge the emotional richness of an animal and the intelligence, of course, of the animal rights movement, whether it's Peter Singer or Tom Regan, but those movements to me are incredibly limited because they're always trying to use the, either the, ability to experience pain sentience or some degree of higher cognition which is going to kind of extend more to up higher mammals uh, and I've always found that to be a good starting point but then I think of someone like Derek Jensen who we've emailed a little bit back and forth about or texted back and forth about who looks at the idea of language as being capable and present in all beings and whether it's in a bird call or whatever that is evidence of the emotionality of those beings and that the ability to cross that that gap and to actually try to connect on an emotional language level is is part of that recognition process but these animals are always there and in fact if you look at 
there's a great book that I have when I, when I have a bad day that I turn to called animal friends. And it, it, it basically catalogs, um, relationships that animals have between themselves, you know, birds with, with cats, birds with domestic cows and cattle, these, these things that we observe in the world that we like to label as symbiotic relationships that don't seem to have anything other than a utilitarian kind of effect that play will in fact they're probably also friends on the on the level that we would be friends with somebody there's a kinship a mutual exchange of love and affection which i think is part of all this so for me how this all got started was just observing regularly and i've never been the type of person that thought i was higher than another animal i always think that you know humans are the most dominant dangerous animal uh, there's a great line and uh in a book called The Spell of the Sensuous, which looks and, and it basically is a taking in of our eyes and our, our, our opposable thumbs and the fact that we're a pretty scary presence on the earth. And so first recognizing that, that we walk around in a way that already transforms the likelihood of us relating to other animals, um, we walk around in a way that's pretty threatening and being able to recognize that is always gonna color the responses that animals give you. So there's an idea, right, that in, in media and movies and books all, and parables always look at animals as pretty dangerous. Nature is this kind of dark place. The Garden of Eden is a place of sin, right? Um, there's a lot of ways in which those kind of things are operating in the backdrop of all humans that basically don't allow us at the first level to even see an animal on its own terms, let alone an insect. Um, and the descriptions that we have, of course, you know, animal, insects especially get a bad, a bad rap for being pests, when in fact their presence is, is essentially ecologically necessary to clean up our waste products. Um, so I think about a lot of those things and that, what does an animal look like when it's present for its own self and not for me? Um, and that's a complicating factor, right? If I'm being really honest, I'm a rescue person but over the years, I probably would argue pretty vehemently against pet ownership. Um, but because we have an endless stream of discarded animals, that's what complicates it. So I, I will take them into my home and, and I wish there was a way to catch and release, you know, even domestic animals, but that's just a reality that you're referencing that we'll talk about in the future is that when we transform the natural world and urbanize it and close it in and it has effects on us, industrial agriculture, et cetera. It also transforms that whole sort of backdrop of life um, in ways that are, that are difficult to kind of go back and find some kind of idyllic state where animals can live on their own, like hunter gatherers allowed or how indigenous folks would, would interact. Um, I know I'm kind of straying here, but the point I'm trying to set up is that I think it's Tim Morton, Timothy Morton, who's the, chair of the English department at Rice University he is a guy who at first I disliked strongly. He wrote a book called Ecology Without Nature. And of course I took the book from its title and, and thought it was another classic academic kind of dismissal of the natural world because academia has a huge problem as soon as you put an animal above a human, especially animals in countries where humans don't even have full rights there becomes a very slippery slope where the human always has to be there. You also have to be super careful through the ways in which animals have been used to strip groups of human beings of rights, et cetera. There's a complicated racial species level kind of use of animals for self-identification that we're all having to kind of unpack to get there. But what Timothy Morton describes, most of his books now are about how to be in solita solidarity with non-human beings and what that looks like. And he describes what he, these, what he call, calls hermeneutical clouds, where everything that we're trying to kind of grasp through our experience and our witness of the world outside of us is clouded and is self-referential. And I do find that to be the case, like predominantly the human self is Judeo-Christian in its origin and comes from a dominion status of the human being given these certain keys to the kingdom. And so the idea of pet ownership in and of itself makes no sense ecologically, um, in my opinion, because it's 
we would have allies and certainly we're, there's tons of evidence in prehistorical literature where, and not where, and let's just say pre-industrial literature where wolves and other types of animal, canines and felines and other and birds, et cetera, have always had a certain slippage where they would interact with human beings. That's pretty obvious. I mean, from cave paintings and things like that, that animals have been partners. So I think it's really important to understand that we've had animal friendships throughout our existence on the planet, but we weren't always in the role of caretaker or oppressor. It was more of a passing in the natural openness of the world, right? And then we would develop affinities for that. Um, so let me just stop you there because, you know, yeah. I, um, <clears throat> just, just a little getaway this, this uh, uh, summer with the, with the dogs and the wife and uh, read uh, um, Ishmael, all, all the books. <laughs> so, and, and it gave me a really interesting perspective that you just kind of laid out in terms of the Judeo-Christian perspective on ownership and dominion and, and stuff. And, and it strikes me, you just want to kind of do a deeper dive. Dog owners, meaning their property, you can't have a kin relationship with something that's property. You can't really, it's, it's a different type of relationship. And I'd like you to kind of unpack that more. And, but also, if you would, because I know you're not like a vegan, say, oh, you cannot eat meat. I you was. Know, yeah. I was where you was, <laughs> no longer. I mean, and I say people who are, that's a different conversation. Yeah. But, you know, you do recognize at least for some set of the population, eating meat is appropriate. So they're, ha you know, so you have to, I don't know the language you want to use, but if you could talk about property and property in ownership of animals for you know, domestic animals, as opposed to kin and relationship with them, but also to contextualize that and the fact that, well, some people are meat eaters and at least from your perspective, that's okay. Well, it's a slippery slope. So as as I got deeply into the animal writings and research, I became an ethical vegan for nine years. Um, I think one thing that is not appreciated about vegans, especially ones that are doing it ethically, and we can argue all day long about how ethical it is. People will throw it up in the face. Well, you know, harvesting of plants in mass kills lots of mammals. Plants are clearly conscious and alive as well. Yeah. Um, but I think the fact is that there are people that are so bothered by the violence that is necessary to take an animal life to eat it that they're willing to harm their health to 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 not participate or you look religiously at the idea of ahimsa which is to non-harm okay if we were truly to look at a human diet animal proteins would have a place so when i hear like in this modern sort of world of the carnivore diet being therapeutic, which I've actually used with clients to some success in the short term, and the idea of regenerative farming and, and this idea of, you know, animals as being central to the human diet and animal fats being central to the quantum leap in the human brain. I mean, all of that stuff is certainly evidenced in, in the fossil records and in paleontological research. But the point is, is that animal proteins have always been, you know, a moderate part of the human diet and humans never really had an opportunity to have an exclusively determined diet. We kind of ate what we came across. So I think the idea, so that idea that Michael Pollan throws out of the omnivore's dilemma, um, I'm not necessarily a subscriber to Pollan's way of thinking, but I think that eating an animal who lives in the wild and having to hunt it and confront the acts that are all involved in that and then realizing that some of those molecules are necessary. And in fact, if we want to truly get back into a natural ecosystem, we as humans would also be eaten by other animals. I think there's a hard recognition. So once when I was an undergrad, I had a professor in urban studies who was an environmental artist who I did work with named Claude Willie. And I remember one time he accused me of basically alighting the violence, you know, that exists in the world. Um, that I was always trying to escape the fact that that violence was a part of being on the planet and, and killing is an act of violence. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, eating is required to survive. Um, but I think about the best illustration of why veganism and why animal rights becomes 
important to acknowledge, especially in an era where people are eating carnivore, eating paleo, where we're recognizing that a, a grain-free, seasonally oriented diet that's rich in animal proteins and fats is probably our, our, our genetic birthright. That's genetically what's most appropriate. I think it's important to also acknowledge that what most vegans and vegetarians and ethically minded eaters are having a problem with is the mechanism by which the animals are processed into the human diet. So if you think of that classic 1971 movie, The Waka or Walkabout, which essentially has what I would consider to be some pretty gratuitous scenes of violence, but it basically looks at an English uh, family and two children specifically that are abandoned by their father in the outback. And they're befriended by an Aboriginal, young Aboriginal man. And he basically proceeds to hunt with spears and clubs and kills, you know, 60 or 70 animals legitimately on the screen juxtaposed with Australian hunters shooting them with guns and things like that. And there's a very obvious problem between those two realities. The one where the Aboriginal is hunting one-to-one -one in an open real world where the animals are wild roaming and in their own habitat with their own experiences, the act of the way he's doing it looks brutal and violent. But when you actually think of it in the context, it's actually a very beautiful fullness and then you see the hunter shooting an animal from 500 yards away with a lead bullet, it starts to look really sickening. So I think the couple of things we have to acknowledge is that when we decided to go into an agricultural species, which is the foundation of capitalist society, we stopped hunter gathering, we stationary human society, we went to grain based things, and then we actually formed both human structures of oppression, but also animal structures of oppression that are all about enclosure. And this is something that you see, right, if you're working with, with this lady who's taking an indigenous perspective of relating to Mother Earth, so to speak, Native peoples, the first thing that they protested was the enclosure, the fencing of gigantic pieces of land and ownership and not moving freely with the rhythms of the earth, right? And so you see that as being kind of part and parcel of this kind of descent into a world, I'm getting to the dog ownership thing, oh, to where all good. It's all good. we constructed this reality where we have a dog on a leash. And the irony for me is thinking, and this is going to come out of left field a little bit, but when we see humans like at Folsom Street in San Francisco, walking other humans with collars like in a BDSM setting, it's immediate or a master slave relationship in alternative sexual communities, right? it automatically creates this really hard moment of recognition. But when people are out walking their dogs, controlling when the dog can go to the bathroom, <laughs> when it can eat, and then when it, uh, and one of the things that you hear pet owners say all the time, not you or, or your wife, but, oh, my dog just lays, he look at him, he just lays around all day, right? Well, there's this way where we've got these animals and we kind of are attempting to understand them in a, so, such a limited context that it does more damage than good. So it isn't natural to walk around with an animal on a leash. Animals have to be, I used to live in the Bay Area where they trained all the guide dogs for blind people. And I would watch all day long the guide dogs for the blind, you know, uh, training those animals. And it was a very violent on the one thing, destruction of that animal's uh, ability to live its own life. It was constantly being given treats in order to have a, such a controlled response that it became automatic and, and without agency. Um, but it's a slippery slope, right? Because pet owners that are evolved and that have the resources, and that's the other thing that economics also plays into often how well animals are treated as well. You know, uh, but if you look at overall domestic animals, we always control their reproduction. And so there's that patriarchal kind of expansion of what we would do to women, to animals of all types, spay and neuter all the animals, um, you know, do all these things. And of course that makes sense on a level to kind of control the suffering of animals and these huge pet populations. But at the same time, if we had worlds where there was more room for animals to freely associate, 
in their own environment where it was safe and they could hunt food and do things, I think that we would begin to see a different relationship. But at it, it best, we're now having to try to skirt this line of being caretakers and allies and not dominant kind of owners. And there's an interesting dichotomy there that you have to try to, to skirt, but you know, and pet ownership is here to stay. And I, I think it has important things. I think that it can be utilized as a way to increase kinship and love and understanding and realize that connection does not stop at the species line. But then there probably has to be some type of advocacy for a more, I guess, rewilded pet. I, I don't know, but it's a complicated thing. And, and I think I think that's precisely why veganism, as it meets up with paleo eating as this big cultural confluence that's created all these really vitriolic um, encounters, what that's actually referencing is how messy this whole human animal entanglement is. Um, and there's to me ethical gradients where industrial factory farming and the way that animals are slaughtered is having been in these slaughterhouses personally and watched these acts, it's something you can never unsee and that's not okay. In my opinion, that's not okay. But are there times when I've eaten a package of bacon from an animal that was put through one of those? Yes. But I'm not, I don't get away with not knowing what happened there. Um, so there's this whole like, apprehension of the fact that eating requires the death of other things which i think is really hard to even want to think about as a human being or a person of any uh, species identification and then there are all these other entanglements that we have some productive some not that are a product of how we've self-organized our society that i think are hard to go back and and kind of resolve i don't see us going back to the way of the native peoples in the United States with no fences until, you know, a capitalist society is abolished or something, but there's all these things. And then there's the symptoms of it, like climate change and pollinator loss and the poisoning of the human body. And so it's, it's how does one wade through all of that for that direct experience with another being that begins to offer a way into resolving these entanglements in a way that's good for, both, both the human animal and the non-human animal. And these are very complicated questions. Um, and many questions you can't even ask because, because they're not even considered to be on the table because of the assumption of who has rights and who doesn't. So what I think about, there's a lady who I love named Carol Adams, wrote a really great book called The Sexual Politics of Meat. And she has a great line in there if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so when I, when we look at it in the larger context of what's happening like in the world, especially in the United States right now with the Black Lives Matter and a lot of social injustice movements coming to the forefront, what a lot of that's also asking for is for people that are in dominant power positions to step back and yield the power, give it back, redistribute it. And so I think pet ownership provides an interesting potential for that. But then there's so many complicating factors. And I know I'm going a lot of play, but I've thought about these things for 15 years and have explored various threads of this. But one of the things I think that's really strange, like today, a company I shared with you, I will be ordering up raw food made of cows, pigs, tilapia, rabbits for my domestic animals. Um, it's a very, so there's a whole set of animals that are being put to slaughter just to feed our domestic pets, which is very strange. And, and, and the way, if you think about it. So I've just been trying to think about like all these relationships and having to live with the uncomfortable truth that I probably need to eat animal proteins and animal flesh to survive at a high level and be healthy, not survive. We can survive without animals. Vegans and vegetarians do it. Part of the reason why I got chronically ill at 30 years old was from my nine year vegan diet. Um, that's clear. Um, but then, you know, how do we walk around? And I'm, I'm to the point now where 
I drive around 17 miles an hour on average around town, not just a hyper mile in my hybrid car, but because I don't want to hit the butterflies and I can see caterpillars walking across the street. I don't kill ants. I do not kill roaches. I'm not trying to be self-righteous, but that's how far I've extended this. And because I've done that, I, it gives me a real window into how easy it is to throw, sort of throw all of these other life forms into a box, seal it up. And then what that produces is a form of everyday consciousness. And it gets kind of to what Ayn Rand, not Ayn Rand, sorry, um, Oh gosh, her name slipped in my mind. But the idea of the banality of evil, Hannah Arendt, you know, it's we're not engaging in overtly vicious acts. They're just banal acts that have consequences when reproduced over time. So trying to use higher levels of consciousness to glimpse and maybe entertain the idea that your dog has a complex, rich emotional life that actually cannot be fully apprehended by a human, even in a lab setting. Mm -hmm that probably does love you, but probably has desires and, and unrequited needs and things like that that we'll never know, um, that probably is eating close to maybe what it ate, but maybe not, you know, because who knows what. So just beginning that conversation from place of curiosity, which is what Derek Jensen suggests in his books, but not doing it in a way where we're just inherently always blaming ourselves and feeling like we're just awful perpetrator some people are some people are not but that's kind of the approach that i've always taken hey what if this dragonfly that's landing on me isn't just here as an emissary with a message for me like in shamanic terms but is actually here to communicate with me and interact with me as a form of relationship and then just looking at its form and its body and wondering what its experience is like and, and seeing what it would be like to just say, hey, like my whole backyard is specifically and exclusively for wildlife. You know, we're putting in 200 trees uh, through tree people in January to feed the possums, raccoons, habitat for birds. I have pollinator plants everywhere. It's also like sharing the space that we all live in with everybody else. And in in the urban studies architecture world, they call it rewilding, reestablishing wild, wildlife corridors. I know you've sent in the past and posted buildings that have biophilic design, et cetera, et cetera. To me, that doesn't go farther for, far enough because we're still not relating. We're creating habitat, but we're still uneasy, say, when a bobcat walks down the road. <laughs> um, so those are just the ways that I've been rehearsing, so to speak, to use kind of a literary term, rehearsing what it would be like to be a post-human in the sense that I'm no longer the center of God's creation, if you believe in God, center of the universe, whatever it is, and just a member of this huge symphonic, you know, kind of multi-dimensional symbiosis of life that's all required in order for the totality to be healthy. And I think one of the things, it's an ax that I kind of want to grind, but I'm not going to do it too much today, but like 2020, because of the politicization of the coronavirus, we've lost a massive opportunity to confront our climate position. You know, the fires in Australia happened before COVID became a pandemic and we lost a billion animals. Yeah, yeah. We had the fires in California. We've had more hurricanes in the Gulf than ever in history. So in viruses, if you look at them metaphysically are transformative agents, they're not bad necessarily, though I work with people who have been paralyzed by COVID from brain inflammation. So I don't want to minimize it, but the point is, is that the idea of zoonotic infections now being at our doorstep and affecting us should have been first and foremost an ecological awareness, awakening. And in fact, it has not been really at all. Um, so a couple of things I'm, I'm getting at here. There are always going to be animals that are proximate to us, whether domestic or not, that we can have direct relationship with. And then there's a whole host of other animals who we'll never see, especially in the oceans. Mm -hmm. And for me, the ideal world, if I could live in it, would be one where that, those buffers and those untouched areas where human endeavor had not even put its fingerprints on would be 
widely distributed throughout the planet. Um, and there wouldn't be any fight over whether that should be protected or a thing. You know, the funding should go to that just for the intrinsic value of having untouched lands and not just for the selfish human desire of those areas being necessary for our survival. They are. Um, we're losing about 7 billion trees a year on the high end estimate and at, at least three and a half billion a year. Um, and we know that with every tree that we lose, we lose habitat. So my thinking of domestic animals these days is how can a domestic relationship with a pet animal produce the kind of consciousness that then makes future generations of domestic animals more wild? Mm -hmm. And how can it also remove, you know, how do we stop the encroachment of human settlement and how do we think about our numbers? And, and can we, in fact, you know, are humans rational enough to behave and that and it, that gets to a funny thing that humans reproduce like amoeba in a pond. We are the only other species that has a J population reproduct, reproduction curve, which means we populate, populate, populate until we crash. And that was a fundamental piece of two instrumental books called The Limits of Growth and one called Overshoot that founded the 1970s environmental thoughts of climate change. Um, so I know this is not exactly what you want to get at. And I don't want to de demonize or vilify pet ownership because I, the only reason why I'm on Instagram these days is because I love looking at how many good people are out there taking care of animals and doing so in a way that is just beautiful and healing. And I love to see the animals and I love to see the relationships that the animals have with each other. Um, but I do think that, you know, it isn't a natural thing. And therefore the ways that we're expected to kind of learn from that, those relationships are tricky. Um, they require a lot more than maybe we're willing to put into it. That is not just about feeding and, and meeting medical needs and all of that. Um, and, and maybe in fact, we'll never be able to communicate one-to-one, -one, but you know, we kind of work out communications with our animals. They know how to tell us what they need, but it usually gets lumped into like, Oh, I'm hungry right now. You know, I would like to know what an animal is on it on this planet for for its own spiritual evolution. You know, yeah. um, so that's the complex thing. How do we extricate animal kind of agency from human needs? Yep. Uh, and and how can we do that in a way? And, and there's a couple of folks that have tried to to think through that. Uh, Timothy Morton being one of them. Um, as a, as a way to begin to maybe save ourselves on the planet, but maybe take that huge project off the table and just as a way to have a richer experience of nature, quote unquote, because nature often just becomes like a, a, a green screen of experience that things are projected onto uh, and viewed. And so one of the guys that I was telling you about, one of the guys, he's, he's Jacques Derrida, he, he, he's one of the preeminent critical theorists, post-structuralists, um, a guy that would definitely be credited for some of the ideas that we have with, with kind of non-binary thinking around sexuality and gender, et cetera, along with all the women that put that work in. What his last book was called The Animal That Therefore I Think I Am. And he had cats and he had this uncanny recognition of, of himself in the mirror and of his animals in the mirror and what that actually meant. And he went on this whole thing to attempt to understand the animal. The question of the animal, which then opened in 2004, the ability of, of academics to start. So when I did my master's degree was 2004 to 2006. I was one of maybe five people in the U.S doing critical animal studies work. Now there's probably several thousand and there's probably 20 or 30 departments doing that. Critical animal studies is now given away to plant studies where we're asking all these same questions about agency and, and identity about the plants that surround us. Um, and so there's a natural kind of progression there. But the idea is that, is that animals have always had to use our mirror and our image as a way to construct their own identities and that's highly problematic and that's a very simplistic thing but those are the things that I've always kind of thought about as somebody who weirdly went into the animal relationships as a young person without that frame of reference um, I, 
and and so it's 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 just something that that continues to kind of unfold but i'm trying to figure out like how can we create platforms of relationship that can change these situations where if we are eating meat, okay, let's, let's have that idyllic regenerative farm in mind where an animal lives, eats the things it's meant to eat, and then is slaughtered in a way that, that is quote unquote honoring and humane if death can be that way. Um, but you know, then I ask myself, how do we feed 7 billion people in a regenerative setting, which a lot of those people like Rob Wolf think is possible, I do not. Um, maybe a small part of the agriculture going to that because when i was in grad school we did a carbon hoof printing study and we looked at the carbon footprint of meat eating and not just from industrial production facilities from all of it and smart and regenerative farms do often have carbon sequestration and net zero effects but they're certainly still problematic i mean ruminant animals require a large space so there's just a lot of complicated ways in which domestic relationships with animals are the way into much more complicated animal human questions or human animal questions but they require a, a pretty tricky shifting of consciousness that i don't exactly know how to produce um uh, uh, if that makes sense to you i know i'm kind of rambling a lot of ways no, no, it's but great you've actually covered so many of the things that i wanted us to cover and and you know, at the beginning of this, it, I kind of laid it out as a philosophical exploration, which obviously, you know, a lot of these are questions to be asked, not necessarily have answers, or there are, might be some answers, but they're not necessarily so good answers the way we've done it to date. Um, so I definitely appreciate, like, some of the, the tangents you've gone on. But for people who are listening, who are, who are either beginning to or now as a result of these, this conversation are starting to ask these questions and they want to change their relationship some as, as best as they can within the life that they live with at least their domesticated pets. You know, uh, one of the things when I started this conversation with you is, you know, the way we eat conventionally as human beings, at least here in the West and the way we feed our animals is very similar. Yeah. I'm wondering if, you know, if there were like, oh, here, here are a few things your listening audience can at least start thinking about and maybe acting upon or implementing it in their lives and in the lives of their pets that would be beneficial for them, their pets, and maybe even start changing their consciousness about how they think about the natural world as well. What might some of those things be? I think just, uh, starting with food, it's very obvious and it's also not recommended nearly enough animals that eat raw food especially canines and felines tend to do pretty well um, especially so when you think of in the carnivore community someone like paul saladino recommends this nose to tail carnivore diet well the healthiest animals eat nose to tail raw food that's what my animals eat um, that keeps most of them healthy and not in need of homeopathy um, and then it's doing some background research, like what would a, a canine that's wild have eaten? Truly, I mean, what would those animals have had a, you know, eaten a cow or a pig, or would they have eaten more, you know, poultry or smaller game or lizards or geckos? Like what would that look like? Um, the common denominator that uh, in both of our worlds that destroys our health obviously is the grains and, and, and especially plant anti-nutrients like oxalates and things like that. So kibble is basically poison in a bag for the most part. Um, and if you look at animals that eat raw, they tend to drink much less water because most animals get their hydration from eating organs and other things. There's just a lot of things that are out there but if you look at animals and you look at animal stomach ph's uh, dogs and humans have similar ph in the stomach which means we're scavengers cats have a much more acidic ph they're they're the pure carnivores and they they like fresh kill um so you can kind of approximate that that's one thing is just to really understand raw food and 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 the potentials that it offers and then having to wade through all the, the terrifying kind of things a year out there, what happens when you feed raw. Because there's an idea in animal veterinary medicine and, and animal care that things like science diet and 
and things that are not natural are somehow superior where we've intervened and recreated the diet, which is not true. So the first step is looking at the diet. The second step is some exercises that I've not really recommended anybody, but I think about when I watch homeowners, cause I, our business is in a building that has, you know, lots of dog owners that are stuck in apartments. Every time I see animals out on a walk, especially dogs, every attempt that they have to sniff something that they want to sniff is usually stopped, you know? Um, so I think about letting an animal, especially a dog or a cat have its natural curiosity to explore environments and allow it to associate with other animals. Um, and this older kitty that we, uh, so my girlfriend adopted a 10 year old cat from one of the local shelters who had been part of a family of three he seemed to be pretty old and lat lat lethargic and he went raw, but you would not believe how much this guy wants to play and be stimulated mentally. Now that he's raw, his energy's up 500%, you know, um, he has to play constantly. He only likes interactive play. The interactive play makes him eat more. Um, so there's a lot of things where, just trying to observe your animal and, and looking for things like where it may be frustrated or where it may be able to, to, to tell you things. Um, what the relationships between, if you have more than one animal, start to give information and insight about. Um, and not just the rivalries and kind of standoffishness that you can see between domestic pets, but I think really just starting to pay attention to how you interact with your animal, how you feed and care for it but also just observing what it does when it's not dealing and interacting with you you know what are its sleep patterns what are the things that inspire it what birds does it look at what insects does it chase what sunlight does it like to be in you know i think that those are ways in and then when you go out and, and use that same frame and start paying attention to the very few animals that we see in the urban environment, the pigeons, the little small birds, the squirrels, and to, to continue to observe, not from a, a vantage point of doing anything or necessarily relating, but just watching. Um, that to me will start to inspire more inquiry if, it, if people want it, but at the very least it might start to activate some insight into how we're behaving with our animals, how we're relating, and maybe take it seriously that your animal has a lot more to tell you and there's a lot more that's possible in your relationship. Um, especially if you treat that other being as if it's an equal. Um, and, and I think also understanding where the limitations are. I always tell dog owners, if you have a golden retriever or a black lab, you're dealing with an animal that's been kept around age one in terms of men mentality. So if you think your animal is not intelligent, that's not true. It's been bred to be that way. So also understanding the parameters of the breed that you have, you know, if you can. Um, what are those breeds? Where do they come from? What's their history? I mean, you'll learn a lot about them. You'll learn a lot about the environments that their genetics came through. Mm -hmm. I even have a book on canine methylation and nutrigenomics. You really? <laughs> yeah. Um, it surprised me, actually. Yeah. It's pretty cool, it, you know, and just kind of how to keep the, the genetic systems robust. Um, but yeah, I think those are some simple things. I mean, there's a lot more I could say there, but I don't want to get too far away because that's plenty. But I, observation without objective, I think, is just huge. And there's plenty of times when, you know, I see one of my animals and I'm like, you know what, I want to go pick him up or her up or get in their personal space. And I'm kind of, and I, and I look and I say, you know, they don't want me in their personal space right now. <laughs> um, mm. And I'll learn to ask permission, you know, like, can I pick you up right now? If you're not asking me to just simple things like that. And then we kind of have our own rhythms. Uh, and then there's times when maybe they only want to hang out with each other and then trying to be very understanding like if an animal goes to the bathroom in the house because I couldn't get up at 4 a.m. or something, you know, like checking myself and getting pissed off about that. Yeah. Um, and, and good pet owner is good, you know, qualitative judgment. People, most, most people are like that. But I think that animals also get made to kind of be the surface that gets projected on for frustrations as well. And that's another thing that I 
I check that in my human relationships, but I also make sure that I check it in my animal relationships because it's really easy to do that. Yep. Um, that's that's so, really good advice. Yeah. Uh, simple stuff, but, and then just, you know, look at somebody like a Derek Jensen and read, you know, his books are very confrontational and they're hard to get through because of that. But the idea of bringing the world's languages alive. And one thing that I wanted to say that I want, it's a little unrelated, but, Bernie Krauss is a guy who's an ethnomusicologist, basically, and he predominantly does field recordings of animal sounds. Hmm. And he's given some TED Talks on how nature is actually going silent because we're losing so many species. Um, but what I'm thinking of is when you think, because I know you have practices in indigenous plant medicine and indigenous culture and all that kind of stuff, right? So. I think of like Carlos Castaneda and the soft gaze and what it's like when you go into nature, especially having lived in the Amazon, when it's a, a symphony of sound, also learning sensually to start bringing in all those sounds of nature if they're there and turning the volume up on all of them. Because in some ways that alone starts to produce and propel you forward, you know, in your understanding of the world not to say I understand anything, but I'm trying to at least get into proximity of that flow of life. I think those are practices that are pretty easy to do. Nice. Um, and your that. domestic pets are great at that, right? They're all the inflections of their voice and different ways that their body language suggests things. So, you know, that's just it. And, and really, you know, if you can have your pets off leash and things like that, do it. Um, but I also try to think that my animals aren't here for my benefit. They're here for their own. I'm taking responsibility to feed and care for them because that's the world we live in, but they're here for themselves. Just like we are. And, and, and I don't know if we always explicitly acknowledge that, if that makes sense, but just trying to be as good of people as we are for each other, for our animals and our animal friends and our plant friends. Um, and maybe thinking about insects too because uh, that's, that's my current group yeah, that I'm uh, really fascinated by. And I'd like to actually have you back on, so I think it'd be interesting to do a deep dive uh, discussion on plants, insects, all, yeah. all of that as well. Um, and I also get into agriculture, which you touched upon, but I think we, you know, obviously it'd be really important to do a much deeper. deeper yeah. And, and I, obviously I love regenerative ag. I don't want to look like I'm just like a skeptic there, but yeah. I would love to talk more about the details because I think that the science is really cherry picked. Um, and of course I would support it over any other organization of agriculture, but it's just another human techno fix for the mess that we've made. And it's unlikely to be anything more than a band aid. Um, so you know, we can talk about that. And it also continues to put us in this diminutive creator role that we might not should be in. So we could totally talk about plants, landscape, landscape design. You know, that's what my dissertation was actually about shamanic consciousness and design. You know, um, I definitely so. want to talk to you about, and I won't do this now, but uh, yeah. design, because one of the things that strikes me when I talk to my wife is, you know, obviously the shelters do the best they can with the limited resources yeah. they have. But I have to imagine with a different mindset and perhaps better resources, a better habitat could be designed to help oh, yeah. animals transition from where, where, wherever they come from, in many cases, really bad situations, to where they're going to eventually go, hopefully to a forever home, yes. to make that transition safer, more secure, less stressful. Yeah, I think that would be a wonderful topic, design, because design is, and maybe more like what I would call creating openings or successional strategies. But yes, yeah. Temple Grandin is somebody in the animal world. I have a lot of problems with her work, but she's on the spectrum and she's designed a lot of the ways in which animals go into slaughter to try to make it more comfortable and not as scary mm -hmm. for the end of their life. Um, but she, she thinks she can think like an animal, which is where we're running into problems, but she's, she tries to think about that design of space, especially mm -hmm. for animals and shelters. A lot of the really good no-kill shelters have fantastic designs internally to reduce stress. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that'd be wonderful. And this, uh, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. This is something that's kind of been laying dormant, but I, it's a big part of my life. I've spent 20 plus years academically working through all this stuff. Um, 
and it's important. I think it is the issue, the animal, human, plant, and world nexus is is the issue. Well, it's, it's interesting because really it, 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 I, I would agree because if we not figure it out, but if we change that whole dynamic, a lot of the other issues which seem to be the real issues fall into yeah, place. They do. Not resolved on their own. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so where can people learn more about your work? Um, so I still have Cosmic Animal with a K. Uh, that's my site that's more geared towards genetics. And then Xenogenesis with, with an X is the wellness center that I run. Um, and those are the two places. And then I'm on some podcasts here and there. Yep. That's predominantly about health. Um, I think, I guess, Chris Ryan's a little more wide ranging than that. But that's it for now. <laughs> um, hopefully I'll be putting out some writing and some more kind of content that can be assessed, but that that's in the works for the next year. Or so, well, Ryan, thank you so much. I uh, love this conversation. Look forward to Absolutely. having you on for a third time. Absolutely. And, uh, we're going to close this out with my, one of my favorite singer songwriters, uh, Stuart Davis, his song, nothing in between, which is kind of apropos for, for this conversation. Sure. And it's actually a song we played at our wedding. So, uh, Ron, I'm going to let you enjoy Stuart for a few minutes and then we're going to close this out. There is nothing in between us when we sleep. Every night we bless the baby. Nothing in between us when we laugh. Something that our head will never grasp. It's nothing in between your joy and mine. It's all a lot of nectar on the line. Joy is how my parents were entwined. There's nothing in between their lives and mine. Don't let a hide in the open reality. Your love is so wide that there isn't a boundary. And that's Stuart Davis. Thanks, Ryan. Take care, buddy.